Now, according to a survey conducted, more than 60% of South African workers are regular users of generative artificial intelligence. Now, this is according to a survey that was conducted by management consulting firm Oliver Veyman. Now, when one talks AI, some are concerned, while others say embrace it because it's the future. So let's speak now to Vert's associate professor of actuarial science, Dr. Rendani Mbuba, who is joining us now for this conversation. Thank you so much for your time this evening. So let's just begin here. What are we talking about when we're talking about generative artificial intelligence? Uh, thank you, Bungiwe uh, and your viewers. Um, Bungiwe, when we're talking about generative uh, uh, artificial intelligence, we're primarily talking about a form of artificial intelligence that can recreate patterns in data. Uh, some of these patterns in data are patterns we see in text, which is quite common. So if you see you know, a, a, a letter written, uh, a newspaper article written, uh, the forms of artificial intelligence that are coming up now are those that can recreate a conversation, generate what the most likely next word is in a conversation, and therefore uh, be able to write documents, uh, respond uh, in a, in a two-way uh, chat conversation with, with, with people, and other cases also generate images. So it's really algorithms that can be able to recover structures that exist in the data that we see and be able to therefore generate them um, when they're operational. And as you talk about, I mean, I'm thinking about when you write an email, for example, there's already some words that it predicts for you um, mm -hmm. that you may then be able to use to construct this particular sentence. Is this mm -hmm. a good thing? Just repeat the question, Bunga. Is it a good thing to have this at our disposal? Yes, there are two ways to think about it. One way is the efficiency, and that's where generative adversarial uh, intelligence has become really, really good, is that it allows us to pick in our writing, sharpen our writing based on our previous experiences. And the reason why you get uh, you know, um, examples or perhaps suggestions for text, because based on your previous texts, uh, it can likely predict what you're actually going to write. On the other end, and it actually sometimes, you know, loosens that muscle that you used to have in terms of, you know, nuances in your writing because you think AI is going to do it for you. So it's always going to be this balance between efficiency and again, you know, keeping ourselves sharp uh, to do the tasks that we used to do in the view of AI. And I'm going to ask you this question because it came up <laughs> earlier on when uh, we we're talking about this conversation that in some instances it appears as if, you know, one is using the phone. For example, you have your phone in your hand, yes. you have a conversation about one thing or another. Before you know it, you open, um, you know, a search engine to search for something and that mm -hmm. pops up, that very conversation in some instances mm -hmm. or even algorithms that link to that pop up. And then some mm -hmm. people saying, are the phones listening to us? Yes, uh, some of it is actually based on an old technology, uh, a technology called cookies. And I'm sure uh, these days by law, particularly in Europe, uh, you're, you're supposed to be told when there are cookies on, on, on your site. Uh, and the cookies, what they essentially do is track your activity uh, on a device or sometimes on, on a web page uh, in that case. And therefore, that sequence of events, that pathway that led you to searching or, or texting about a particular thing is then tracked and then is served upon your arriving in a search engine. And, and that is really the power of cookies. Uh, sometimes you can turn them on and off, uh, but in these days, it's actually quite difficult uh, to keep turning them off because they, they are everywhere. Yeah, uh, they but definitely what is, are. <laughs> and what is interesting is I think there's, there's going to be some reforms in terms of how those are managed and, and we'll see slightly less of it. So what are some of the risks that you believe come with, you know, having um, this at your disposal? Uh, but you know, one of the big things that, that, that necessitates this, uh, as, you, as you can tell from the discussion, all of the talk goes around the data mm. uh, because the ability for these algorithms to learn, the ability for us to train them, uh, really is encapsulated in the data sets that they are fed. Uh, and therefore, who, he who has the data uh, will control the future of artificial intelligence. And therefore, uh, as we proceed, we have to make sure that you know, the monopolies you're talking about are actually quite you know, closely monitored in that you know, it's not going to be the big five uh, you know, sort of uh, conglomerates that are able to sort of uh, you know, control the future of artificial intelligence. That also says, if you are to preserve things like our languages or uh, another big area of artificial intelligence is in nature uh, and in the climate, we have to start collecting 
and, and, and archiving our own data sets such that, you know, the language of AI should not necessarily be only English, mm. but it must be Chivenda that I speak, it must be Zulu, and all the languages that we speak you know, as Africans and South Africans in general. So I think that's something that we certainly have to look out for. Quite an interesting one because, you know, when you read up on it, there's also, of course, um, a view that it can, um, you know, help when it comes to economic growth. There's also, of course, social yeah. change and all of that. But ultimately, all of this needs to be done with inclusivity to ensure that no one gets mm -hmm. left behind. Yes, certainly. I think inclusivity is a key criterion for the future of AI because what, what AI does it encapsulates or repeats the relationships that are already in the data. If the data it's learning from is from an uninclusive economy, is the data it's learning from has some inherent biases. Unless we control or we, we acknowledge that those exist in the data sets, we, we will not be able, we'll just replicate society as it is. And therefore, what we want to do is train algorithms that, that deal perhaps with algorithmic biases and fairness. And, and, and we've seen this in simple data sets like faces of people. A lot of the, in the early days, a lot of the facial recognition uh, software couldn't necessarily recognize black faces in particular, particularly because uh, they were, they were trained in the global north. That is changing. Uh, but then again, uh, if for us to be inclusive in, in the future of AI and in the application of AI, we have to be intentional about how we, how we use it, how we train it, uh, and where we invest in terms of, you know, the data sets that's a collection, because that is really the, 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 the capital intensive element of building AI, is making sure that what, what we use to train these algorithms is representative and talks about the society that we'd like to see uh, and corrects some of the biases that perhaps uh, are, are unwanted in the present day society. So in a country like ours, for example, where there's a concern mm -hmm. of unemployment, mm -hmm. some are saying that looking into the future, um, you know, AI driven automation and it, there's a potential there um, to displace some jobs and further increase the inequalities. How do businesses ensure there are safeguards here to make sure that people are not replaced, but at the same time, that technology is embraced? Yes, so, so we, we certainly have to be forward looking. I mean, you know, AI is, 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 is called one of the technology of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and with all this uh, industrial revolutions that we've seen in the past, the nature of work changes, right? So, uh, so we have to now start preparing for a future where we complement AI. Yes, there's gonna be some, some, some parts uh, of employment or, or jobs that are not necessarily gonna be you know, in high prominence in an AI world, but however, I think we, we have to start thinking in a forward-looking manner where we say, you know, what are the sectors that are going to open up in relation to this? And some of this we've already seen. Uh, we've seen, you know, you know, data analysts, data scientists, are careers that are actually quite in demand. We're seeing that, you know, it's not necessarily going to be just the, the programmer anymore, uh, but perhaps even... Uh, AI itself allows you to get efficiency because it actually supports people who are perhaps new in, in computer science or in programming uh, by helping them like this, write messages, write code a little bit better. So we might find that even in those uh, careers or sectors where, uh, which were high barriers to entry, uh, the opportunities where AI can lower those barriers because it, it will be able to support you based on the data and based on perhaps tasks that were necessarily repetitive in the past, you can actually use AI to actually streamline those. But I think it's quite important that we train our young people to, to be able to, to survive in such a world. We train them con in, in, in contexts that include, you know, uh, how you sort of, you know, men and machine can work together. And, and that is multi-sectorial. All right. I suppose, as you say, catch up. Man and machine must work together. But thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for your insights this evening. That's Virt Associate Professor of Actuarial Science, Dr. Rindani Mboba.